And we talk a lot on this show about the medical scandal that is transgender care, but it's not just hormones and puberty blockers doctors are prescribing to minors. Nearly half a million prescriptions for antidepressants are being given to children and adolescents each year in the UK alone. In the US, a new study reveals antidepressant prescriptions for young adults and teens increased by nearly 64% from 2020 onward. But are drugs the answer to the problems of lost and lonely teens? And is therapy in some cases doing more harm than good? Family psychologist Claire O joins me now. Claire, guidelines for the National Health Service state antidepressants should only be administered to patients suffering from severe cases of depression. Is that what's happening or are we sometimes medicalizing normal human emotions. Yeah, thanks, Rita. And I'll just say that it's not just when we talk about teenagers on antidepressants, it's not uh, just, well, that age that we're talking about. We're talking about a steep rise in primary school aged children. I have children who attend my clinic who have already been prescribed uh, SSRIs, uh, anti-anxiety, antidepressant drugs at six, seven, eight years old. So whilst that's not overly common, it is increasing uh, from certainly throughout my career of the last 15 to 20 years. So I don't know whether, you know, it loses its value how many, many times experts like myself can call out how bad things are. But of course, you know, medication is a band-aid. But I'm getting to the point where I'm not sure now whether can we reverse some of the things that are causing such damage to our children, because essentially it is social media, the internet, the way parenting practice has have drastically changed in the last 20 years, uh, and, and certainly just modern life and the way we live our lives now is what is causing so much damage to our children. So is it reversible? Yes, it is. It is. I mean, within one year, we could change child mental health. Absol I absolutely believe that. Do I think it's going to happen? Pessimistically, I don't, because what it would take is every parent to take a mobile phone off their children, for every parent to get on board with a return to basics of how they're going to parent their children. That is, you know, in not so much of a child-centred, uh, permissive stance where we're mm. so concerned about emotional safety and physical safety, and we actually let kids explore the world, become independent, get some resilience, get some experiences. So it would it would require uh, such kind of almost collective class action that I that I don't think that it's going to happen. However, if we did that, would child mental health improve without the use of medication? I 100% think it would. Now, author Abigail Schreier has just released a new book called Bad Therapy, and it's all about how bad therapy practices are actually making depressed and anxious teenagers even worse off than they would be. Uh, she was on the Joe Rogan show recently. Let's have a listen. They recently did these studies on these, you know, coping techniques. They, they taught coping techniques to um, uh, teenagers, thousand, over a thousand teenagers in Australia. It was called the Wise Teens Program. They talked to, um, uh, and th that was the point. It was just to help them with emotional regulation. And it turned out it made kids sadder and more anxious. They measured this. And the reason was regularly ruminating on your bad feelings can make you feel worse. And it's the number one symptom of depression is what they call rumination, this pathological mm. obsessing over your pain. Yeah. That's why stuff like exercise, that's one of the reasons, aside from chemical reasons, one of the reasons that doing anything, you know that running errands is good for your mental health, getting out of your house and accomplishing anything? Yeah. is good for you. But sitting around talking and thinking about your problems, that's a bad habit. And the best cognitive behavioral therapists and others, you know, the, the dialectical behavioral therapists, the ones who do really well with depression, the first thing they do is try to break that on that that bad pattern. But a lot of therapists just indulge it. Claire, is that how you see it, that some therapists are making their patients worse by having them ruminate about every little grievance? Rita, I've been in contact with Abigail Schreier and this is the book I should have written 
<laughs> it's just like I love this book um, and I am so pleased that she's calling it out. She's not a therapist herself, but she's a journalist who's done a lot of research. This is absolutely the case. I wrote an article some time ago now called uh, Why Mental Health Education is Making Us Sick. What has happened is we throw more and more money at educating people about mental health. And what happens is that mental health diagnoses rise. Now, if you had that with any other medical condition, the more money we throw at breast cancer, diagnoses are coming down. Mental health is the only area that the more preventative work and treatment of billions of dollars we pour into it, the diagnoses rise. Now, some would argue in my industry that that is because more people are feeling like they can come forward, we're reducing the stigma, and we're essentially catching more cases. That might be the case, I would argue, for a very small proportion of why we're seeing mental health diagnoses rise. What Abigail was saying there is absolutely correct. There is a very strong correlation between uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety and this thing we call self-introspection. So that is essentially the more that you spend time thinking about yourself and how you're feeling, the more depressed you're going to become, right? My children have emotion check-ins at school multiple times a day. This is not just therapists doing it. This is the world we concentrate, continually asking children, how do they feel? How do they feel? How do they feel? And it's not helpful. What we know by research is helpful is actually looking outward, uh, getting out, doing things for others, um, and having a purpose, having goals to walk, work towards. So, absolutely, I think therapy, and I'm, you know, a child psychologist now saying we are part of the problem for a lot of kids. And psychologists moved at one point from treating the very clinically unwell patient to now treating the well, the worried well. And when you have a child that's slightly worried about a new situation and you put them in front of a therapist for 10 sessions under Medicare and that therapist spends 10 hours of having that child reiterate to them why they're worried, what there is to worry about, what could possibly go wrong and how they feel about it, they come out worse. And this is a huge problem that I am just so thankful is finally being uh, discussed with research to back it. Well, Abigail Schreier also spoke about why some therapists, some, prefer patients with these minor problems than those with really serious mental health issues. Also, the incentive is for therapists to treat the least sick for the longest period of time. That's the incentive. Because yeah. you don't want the schizophrenic patient who really needs you. Right. They're really hard to treat. Almost impossible. Almost impossible, right? You don't want the bipolar patient. Right. Some people will refuse to see those patients. But a teenager with a little social anxiety, parent pays on time, they're not getting violent in your oh, session. Oh, boy. Wow. Claire, that, uh, that shook me up because I'd never even thought of it in those terms. But it, it makes sense. It, it makes sense why many therapists would prefer that type of patient. A, a kid who's suffering from climate anxiety, for example, as opposed to someone who's got a serious mental health issues, perhaps drug issues. You don't know if they're going to show up. You don't know if they're going to be violent. You don't know if they're going to pay the bill. And you compare that to a affluent uh, child from an affluent family who's a, who's going to be there for every session. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a couple of things here. One, parents are highly motivated to help their children. They'll do whatever it takes, OK? So there's a certain preying on that. And two, it's quite an unequal relationship when you have a child and therapist in the same room. Can that child push back and say, well, I don't really agree with that or I'm done with therapy now? So that's another concern. Yeah. But yeah, it's much easier to treat the worried well than it is clinically unwell, unpredictable, very hard long-term patients. Claire Roy, thank you so much for your time this evening. It has been illuminating.